Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad, uh, dear friends, that um, I'm invited to give a presentation in the Officina. Uh, this is a very, very good platform, which all of you developed. And <clears throat> my presentation will be, so to say, a double presentation. First, of course, I was asked uh, after CAPEX to give a presentation on the pigeon mail of Great Barrier Island. And, uh, which was a very successful exhibit at CAPEX. And um, then I was asked, can you tell us something uh, about the key factors of success uh, for one frame exhibits, how to build them? And by the same time, many people know me as a thematic uh, collector and exhibitor. And um, so I would also like to say at least some few words uh, in the end of the key factors of success for so-called philatelic studies in thematic philately. Uh, um, so the pigeon mail of Great Barrier Island is a quite, quite funny story, which I will tell you before I show you um, the exhibit. Um, these are actually the first airmail stems of the world, which paid an airmail postage fee. Um, so for airmail philately, um, that is a start in the stamp section. You know, airmail philately uh, consists of two different approaches. Um, one is a, say, to, uh, postal history approach dealing with the roots, and the other um, is a rather traditional approach uh, dealing with the airmail stamps paying the rates. Yeah, and for this rate section, um, this is the very beginning. As we will see uh, in a couple of minutes, um, there are three major stamp issues. Um, and, and I tell you the background story, how they came into life, how they were used. Great Barrier Island, not to, um, conf to confuse it with the Australian um, Great Barrier Reef, Great Barrier Island is an island in New Zealand, which is roughly 100 kilometers northeast of Auckland, um, the biggest city in New Zealand. And it was a quite secu uh, secluded island and still is. Most parts of that is, is nowadays rural farming. Formerly they had some small mines, always uh, steady uh, population. Um, however, uh, not much links with, um, with Auckland. The story of this first airmail stamps starts on sea. In 1894, there was uh, the biggest um, shipwreck disaster in New Zealand history. The ship called Wairarapa, which connected New Zealand by that time, Auckland uh, to Sydney, um, wrecked um, just off Great Barrier Island in a heavy storm. Um, it um, came too close um, to um, the reefs around the island and eight minutes past midnight, there's a famous New Zealand book on that, um, uh, it dragged. A lot of people died and it took many, many uh, days to inform people in Auckland and to get help. And by this disaster, they realized how secluded Great Barrier Island is. Great Barrier Island only had one transport boat, which came every month to supply people with their needs, to bring people, to take people back to Auckland. Um, so um, if you needed some tool, for instance, um, you waited until the boat came, then um, you gave that message to the captain of the boat, and one month later, he brought you that tool. If you just missed the boat by one or two days before you can give your order, it took you two months to get something to the island. That was really, really bad. And therefore, um, the leading uh, New Zealand newspaper of that time, the New Zealand Herald, um, they, they set uh, a price of five pounds, a lot of money by, the, uh, by that time, um, for the one who was able to connect Great Barrier Island 
uh, with Auckland so that messages could come through. The New Zealand post office had failed. They run some post offices, small village post offices. Um, as you can see, uh, by the way, one on the picture in, in one of the villages. Um, but um, they only could use the boat once per month. Um, so there was a club of pigeon breeders in Auckland by the time. They had got military pigeons in the mid 1890s, uh, and they tried um, to have pigeons flying from Great Barrier Island back the 100 kilometers to their home loft in um, Auckland. There were two. Um, who were really competitors. They were both excellent. And one of them, Mr. Fricker, did it. And the other one, Mr. Parkins, um, Parkin was not fast enough. However, just a couple of days after Mr. Fricker, he also could uh, run his first pigeon. Um, so on the left side, you see the very first uh, pigeon gram, which is recorded from um, Great Barrier Island. And it's sent from the local employee of Mr. Fricker, uh, praising him for the recent success in this pigeon race um, and announcing the installation of the first loft on Great Area Island um, to install a service. Mr. Perkin also um, installed a service. And he announced it in the newspaper. Um, I have sent, uh, I've uh, copied um, the part of the, um, of the local newspaper in the upper right part. Um, so there were two people running uh, services. The press were quite high. It was one shilling six pence uh, per pigeon gram, um, which someone wanted to send. Um, if you have in mind that a letter by these days um, where uh, was at one penny, then it was equivalent of 18 inland letters. That's quite a lot. And a little bit later, the universal postage was uh, introduced in the British uh, Empire. So uh, then you could, with one penny, you can send a letter, could send a letter from Auckland to London, and for 18 pence uh, by pigeon mail from Great Barrier Island to Auckland. So it was expensive, but the costs were huge because um, they had to bring the pigeons over to Great Barrier Island for a one-way flight by the monthly boat. They had to feed it until there was someone requesting a pigeon gram, and they had people to run it. So that was quite high costs. And from time to time, they lost one pigeon in a storm. Yeah. So um, this gave reason why even one shilling and six pence was not profitable to them. Um, so how um, was it carried? If you look at it, I have on the title page, I have folded uh, one pigeon gram form in the way they folded it uh, before um, be, before um, putting it uh, around the leg on the, of the pigeon so that it could fly. This was the way these pigeon grams uh, were transported. Now imagine the quality in which you can get the originals. If it was flown um, in the decades after, people had to try hard to restore them, to, uh, to iron them, to bring them in a uh, presentable quality. Yeah. And um, there was um, the governor of New Zealand by that time, Mr. Uh, Earl of Ranfurly, uh, who spent two weeks on a hunting trip. And he wanted to be able to instruct his government in case he had good ideas. So Mr. Fricker provided him uh, with 12 pigeons, and he sent him a letter, which you see on the left side, uh, explaining exactly how to use them, how to fold the pigeon grams, how to attach them to uh, the leg of the pigeons. And he even um, sent a pen along with um, the, this letter 
uh, for uh, the governor uh, to test it before killing a pigeon. Yeah, and <clears throat> so um, it was also quite complicated um, to send it from Great Barrier Island down to Auckland. Expensive, complicated. Mr. Perkin gave up. He sold um, his loft and his pigeons um, to a young businessman, Mr. Howie, who was also a member of the Pigeon Breeders Club, but not very successful. But he came up uh, with the idea um, to issue a stamp. And he persuaded um, the um, Auckland newspaper um, to pay him six pence uh, for every stamp used to subsidize his service so that he could sell the stamps for one shilling. That was a very good idea. Uh, originally, he had um, sent it like Mr. Perkin and Mr. Fricker with no stamps on it. And when it came to Auckland, he um, delivered um, the pigeon grams personally within town or forwarded it to a New Zealand post office um, to send it to other parts of New Zealand or even abroad. Yeah. Um, so now we have some business and we have the idea of a one shilling stamp. You can see um, the frame of this stamp, uh, the, the sheet, full sheet of the stamps, um, which was produced locally um, by the newspaper printers. Here you have it in larger. He said special post on this Great Barrier Island, one shilling. And um, three of um, the flimsies which were um, used with this stamp have survived until today. This is the nicest of them. Um, they all were cancelled in the loft in Okopu, one of the villages of Great Barrier Island. When he ran out of stamps, he needed a second one after um, eight months. Uh, he had sold everything and he printed a second again with special post on that. Uh, when they were in use, uh, May, June um, 1989, 1899, sorry, um, the New Zealand Post Office opposed. They said, well, you write post on it. One shilling is a lot of money, and we don't want to see these stamps by error on our parcels or insured letters or something of the very expensive stuff we have. So uh, you must not write post on it. So with the uh, next printing, um, Mr. Howey overprinted uh, some of them uh, of the post with pigeon gram, which he could use for a couple of weeks until he got uh, the next new print with the real pigeon gram inscription. So these are the four stamps um, he issued uh, within the year and the pigeon gram uh, stamp he then used for five years. That is the most common, everything else is very rare. He also um, created a number of uh, of flimsies with prints on it so that they look nicely. And on these, um, he already mentions other agencies like Marutiri, for instance, or Port Charles, Whitford Park. So he expanded his business, uh, which did quite well, uh, so that also other secluded areas get access uh, to this uh, service, even if they were not on Great Barrier Island. Special hope um, he put into um, Marutiri uh, Island. Marutiri, um, north of Auckland, about 150 kilometers north, um, was just opening a mine. And of course, um, the company running this mine wanted some communication with Auckland. So he offered to open a loft and to install uh, an agency uh, on Marutiri Island. First, he overprinted um, some uh, few sheets of his stamp with Marutiri Pigeon Gram. This was a special post stamps, which were 
overprinted. And here you can see uh, one of the two used flimsies. Uh, and then he even issued an own stamp because he really thought this would be very, very profitable. However, uh, the mine collapsed and so the agency. So in total, only one of the stamps is known uh, in used state. The others um, are still present unused and there is a number um, of um, sheets of six uh, still surviving, um, most of them so, uh, surviving the Second World War in a safe uh, in London, uh, but they got some water on it. Uh, so there is only one intact sheet now, which you can see here. Um, so this is because it's the only one uh, from Maritiri Island uh, which survived. This is considered to be the key piece of worldwide pigeon mail. So quite important item. Mr. Fricker, by the same time, had continued with um, his agency. And um, the year after he saw that uh, Mr. Hoey was very successful um, with selling and using the stamps. Um, however, Fricker was the much better pigeon breeder. And so, he said, okay, I also, I copy that, I also issue a stamp, and he issued triangle stamps. And one of the triangle stamp was a 6D stamp. Um, the flimsy you can see here is the first uh, uh, which was used. It was flown on the 11th July, 1899, which was exactly the date of issue. This is known from the local newspaper that on that day, these were available. So, uh, so to say, this is a first first day cover in airmail philately. Not the first stamp, but the first first day usage, uh, which exists in airmail philately. The second stamp he used was for at a shilling. Why did he use two stamps? Well, he had solved the problem um, of uh, flying pigeons back from Auckland to Great Barrier Island. So far, both had only the service. They brought their pigeons by ship to Great Barrier Island, and then the pigeons flew back into their home loft in Auckland. That was what, what they're trained for. And since he was a better pigeon breeder, he was much more efficient, he could offer this service for six pence instead of the shilling, which Mr. Howie asked for. But for the way back, flying pigeons from Auckland to Great Barrier Island, he had a different challenge. The pigeons didn't want to leave the main island, the mainland. So that was why there was only one way service available. But he found out when he carries a pigeon by boat some three miles offshore, then they would not return to their loft in Auckland, but they would um, they would um, head towards the trained loft in on Great Barrier Island. It's easy to trick the pigeons just by the way. Uh, you have to bring the females there. And, uh, you fly only the males. And they are attracted by the females and they go to Great Barrier Island, but only if they were brought three miles off by boat. So that was another, another effort uh, for each individual pigeon to have a boat bring this pigeon offshore three miles. That is why for the service to Great Barrier Island, Mr. Fricker uh, had to ask one shilling for that. So he had two tariffs, one Great Barrier Island, Auckland, six pence, and uh, one for a shilling from Auckland to Great Barrier Island. This enabled him to run two-way communications. There's only one pair of such two-way communication uh, which is left with the two flimsies. You can see the two different uh, tariffs are uh, paid and there is someone asking uh, for accommodation for a friend to send him on a hunting trip uh, on Great Barrier Island and the next day 
uh, he got the confirmation that his friend could go with the next boat and accommodation would be ready. And by the same time, these are the last known dates of usage of these two flimsies. Mr. Howey could not um, achieve these efforts in the quality of his service. So he went to, um, <clears throat> to marketing matters. He called his uh, service, even if he was only the second one installing it, the original. He marked a copyright on each stamp which was used. Um, he wrote it on the flimsies, the original Great Barrier uh, service, yeah, to make clear Fricker would only copy him. Um, so Fricker was the better pigeon breeder, how we, how we, the far better marketing man. But in one instance, which was decisive for the success, he failed. Um, there was a large boat trip um, in Hawaii Gulf in January 1900 uh, for um, a celebration, um, <clears throat> a national celebration in New Zealand. And 1,200 passengers were on that boat. Uh, and Mr. Fricker came with the idea, I print an own flimsy. And everybody on the boat who wants as many pigeons as we have can send a pigeon gram from this boat tour. And uh, so he prepared it. He was very successful with it. On the last minute, Mr. Howey also brought some pigeons. But it was too late for him to print uh, some some nice flimsy forms. Uh, so there are only two or three. Uh, it's not clear two or three um, forms uh, which were sent uh, by pigeons with a blank um, flimsy, which the people did not appreciate. Of course, on board they wanted to buy the fancy one, one of these, which looked more official to him. Even the New Zealand Post uh, made use of this pigeon mail. It was a separate service. It was fully acknowledged. One of the lofts what was even linked with the local post office at Great Barrier Island. So the New Zealand Post accepted it fully, except of the word post on the stamp. And they used it for their telegrams. So if they had telegrams to Great Barrier Island, they brought it to Mr. Fricker to the loft um, in Auckland because he could run the pigeons to Great Barrier Island. And he attached the telegram to the pigeon, sending it to the island. So this is, as far as we know, um, the only telegram in postal history worldwide which was carried by pigeon, the only postal telegram. It is not clear how Mr. Fricker got paid for it. Uh, however, this copy proves uh, that service uh, worked to bring urgent messages. Uh, quite urgent. Brother Tom killed. Come at once. Of course, he should not get it with the next boat and then wait a month until he could go to the funeral to Auckland. So, um, Flimsies, which were not intended uh, for Auckland recipients, uh, were forwarded by the post office. So the post office took them and you could send them locally within Auckland for one penny and with uh, the uni uh, universal uh, postage I already mentioned, you could also send it for one penny to London. Uh, the item below was sent in the envelope uh, on, the, uh, on the right side. And this is considered to be the longest traveled pigeon gram of the world. Not by pigeon, one must say. It went 100 kilometers by pigeon to Auckland and then 20,000 kilometers by boat to London. Um, but you don't have any pigeon gram which traveled a longer distance. Um, not even. Um, <clears throat> Not, not even a balloon message, the one balloon message which exists from um, the 1817 um, Paris balloon mail um, went that long. Uh, there is one to Australia, which is only 18,000 kilometers. Yeah. Okay. 
this service was over um, in um, 1906 um, when New Zealand Post Office had succeeded um, to build um, a sea cable, undersea cable from Coromandel Peninsula up to Great Barrier Island. From that day onwards, uh, people could send messages via cable, via telegram, which was faster, more sufficient, uh, more efficient, um, cheaper, less expensive to say, um, and um, more reliable than the pigeons. So um, this marked the end of the pigeon mail of Great Barrier Island. This is a story behind. And now I, sh I should have one more. No, not in this presentation. Um, so um, I would like, yeah, um, to tell you something about how to build a one frame exhibit out of that. You know of the story, you know of the material. There won't be new material, there won't be new parts of the story. It's now only on how to put it together. Uh, before we look at the pages, um, I would like to mention that, in my view, there are three key factors of success for one, for one frame exhibits. The first is, it is even more important than in multiple frame exhibits that you possess all important items. It's not a matter of completeness. It's never a matter of completeness in philatelic exhibiting, but here it is um, It is very decisive uh, that no important items are lacking. In a one frame exhibit, you are at least at success at top level. Um, they expect to see everything which is important in this exhibit. If you have to share your key items with two or three uh, other exhibitors, that's absolutely fine in multiple frame exhibits. They can be even on the most important areas. Uh, as someone, a Swiss resident, I say, of course, for example, classical Switzerland, there can be three or four top exhibits by the same time. This is hardly the case with one frame exhibits. Yeah. So if you know you can will not manage to get the important items, you can make a nice one frame exhibit, not a really successful one. The second is, do you have a story to tell? You can have a complete collection, but if there is no background story behind, people will look at the frame, they will say, oh, nice, complete, well done, full stop. They will not be excited. People read much more in a one frame exhibit, at least per quarter, than in multiple frames. So I'm not only speaking of jurors, I'm speaking also of people, visitors of exhibitions, people looking at exhibits. In so many instances, um, I've got the comments of exhibits of whatever type one frame exhibits, not my, my own ones. Oh, this and that and that, I have read all pages. This is possible with one frame. If there is no story behind to communicate, People will not read it. They read it only if you have a story to deliver. And the third is, do you have a topic of relevance? I've seen nice exhibits on plate reconstructions, for instance. But first, usually they lack a story behind. And the second is, it's a plate reconstruction. If it's of any stamp, it might be nice, but it is of no relevance. If you have the postal history of one local post office, for instance, you can well show in one frame, you can make a nice exhibit out of it, but one of the key factors of success is lacking. It has no relevance to philately, which other people would consider as such. So I think these are the three um, key questions to be answered. And then it's a fourth one, which is important. Can you show and tell everything in one frame? It's not decisive if there is material for a second frame or not. If there is material for five frames and you have a story, you will not be able to tell it in one frame. 
can be sure. But um, you, uh, you don't have to show everything what exists in these 16 pages, but you must show all important items and you must be able to tell the complete story. This is very important and um, this qualifies a topic for one frame um, exhibit. Now we will look into the frame. Not, don't know why it, here it moves. Um, so um, this was my first attempt to bring everything together, exhibiting for the first time internationally in 2017 um, at, um, at the um, Lupa PEX, which is um, the B national exhibition um, of Brazil and Portugal, which most of you uh, would know of. And by that year, um, they had the, I think, 60 years of Luba Pex, and they invited uh, also exhibitors <clears throat> uh, from Germany and Italy, and Switzerland is just in between of these countries, so I could go. And um, people were very impressed by the material, and um, they gave a very good score for it, and um, the jurors, and uh, really a, a excellent score. And however, um, they asked me afterwards to tell them the story. I thought they didn't read a lot. The most necessary, yes, um, but um, it was not the comment of them. Um, I read all 16 pages. And this is what all we as, as exhibitors want to have the people to read the pages. Uh, so uh, for Capix, I did everything from scratch. And here I have just to change the presentation mode. So hope you can see it. Can you? Uh, uh, yes. Can someone yeah, we we, oh. we we are seeing the okay. The thank you. Yeah, because my my experience from previous presentations is that from time to time it does not work, and then I speak and you don't see anything. Okay, great. Um, so um, now in um, in this um, new version of Capex, um, I work a little bit more with colors. And the main purpose of that is to tell the story of two rivals. You have on one side the excellent pigeon breeder, Mr. Fricker, and on the other side, um, you have Mr. Howie, a clever businessman. Damien, and sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. You are showing the same page. The, the, same, the yeah. first, yeah, the first page. You are not showing the next one. Yeah, yeah. You are I'm explaining the first yeah, page. This is the, the previous version. Yeah, this yeah. is the previous version. Yeah. So this is a new version. No, no, we are not seeing that one, uh, Damien. Uh, we're seeing the the, um, the the one that the you showed one. first. Yeah, the previous okay, one. Okay. Yeah, this was my concern. Yeah. And so, in in that case, I think I have to stop the presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fine. To um, screen sharing. Not if I got it new again. Now choosing this. So better? Uh, no. We, no if, okay, here you go. Now, okay, yeah, now. now we see the one page. Okay, good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for your feedback. Um, that's important because I can't see <laughs> what you see. Um, and um, so um, now, of course, um, as, I, as I said, uh, I use two colors. I use a pink color for Mr. Fricker and a blue color for Mr. Howie to show the two rivals. Um, here now you can, can read it in full. These are the two rivals. And that is a story of the two rivals. The exhibit says the pages of this one, uh, one frame exhibits will tell you the story of the two rivals um, and show some of the most spectacular items of Aerophilately. The letter I mention um, because this material had not been shown on uh, exhibitions for almost 30 years. So it was out of the market. 
and uh, Odet Eliasha was the one sh uh, showing most of them last time uh, when it was shown. And he was not complete uh, because he lacked the items which were in my possession. And then I could get his material, but I stored it for time. And uh, the current generation of aerophilately jurors would never have seen it. So maybe they don't see the relevance. Um, so I mentioned that. And um, this story starts with how um, the pigeons were attached, uh, according to the illustration uh, I had shown. And then uh, you can see how the story is told. And I think this is important as uh, this um, success factor, which I mentioned, that you don't have only the material and well describe each item, but you have a page title here, which gives you an orientation. What is it all about? Uh, it's copyright conflict from the very beginning. Fricker is the skilled pigeon breeder against Howie, the innovative businessman. And then um, it's not in an order to say, as you would do it in a catalog, first I do the one of the services and then I do the second, um, but it's integrated. So I start with Mr. Fricker who won uh, the race to communicate Great Barrier Island with Auckland. And I show his competitor, Mr. Howey, after he had bought um, the service and the pigeons and the agency from Mr. Perkin and how he delivered the mail, how uh, he issued the first stamps. Both are on the same page. And when it has a start, each page is also an end. So as Fricker can see how he gets his service, uh, the epithet, uh, the original, both no charge one shilling for, uh, for a message. So that is, um, so to say, the start of the story. And then it starts with Mr. Howey, with his stamp issues shown on flimsies, um, with his special flimsies he made for the fourth issues and decorative, uh, very marketing oriented. And with his hope, um, to uh, make really large profit out of um, the mines on Mar Marutiri Island, uh, the agency which provoked um, this uh, very well-known stamps, uh, but which economically economically failed. Yeah, uh, Mr. Fricker, by the same way, had continued, and he had solved the uh, the problem of the um, flight from Auckland to Great Barrier Island. So he introduced his stamps with the two tariffs, shown both, all explained, also the reason why does he introduce two tariffs, yeah, uh, as part of the story. And of course, with a philatelic description, this is the earliest recorded date. And this is even from the first, from the day of issue, the first, um, first day cover the earliest first day cover. And um, the uh, both way communication as a result, which were, was uh, possible uh, due to his uh, achievements with the pigeons. Yeah. And then Mr. Howie again comes. So you see it's an interaction between them two. Um, now he had to do something. And now his marketing again, so measures the technical problem, but I had to reinstall everything with the other hotspot. Um, so um, the, uh, the final transportation step is then used for the final page of the exhibit. Also material you have already seen, but now um, my aim was just to, uh, to show you how a story could be told. Yeah, and the final uh, final transportation step is of course a good uh, philatelic end of the story, and in the wording, um, you can then explain that the New Zealand Post um, <clears throat> has uh, now built a cable, and uh, so it was no longer necessary to have the pigeons flying. Yeah, um, so. Um, 
these are my proposals how to make a one frame exhibit um, successful with these three key factors and in the very end two minutes just but um, i know people always when i say something expect something thematic from me as well um, so i will show to you how to deal with the same in thematic philately yeah. in thematic philately this can of course also be um, an important aspect of an exhibit here in uh, this case uh, of uh, birds in australasia so say in australia new zealand and on the pacific islands and um, the pigeons uh, were not native there they were brought to new zealand and uh, so but you can use it of course it's very important material so if you want to make uh, an excellent thematic exhibit you should have excellent material as well so you will try to integrate it yeah but it looks quite different first of all you cannot devote one full frame to that yeah um, so you must be very very concise with the choice of material second is this story needs to be integrated and underlined by thematic material so here look this is the first page of this philatelic story of great barrier pigeon mail and you see only one item namely um, the first ml stamp of the world in a full sheet uh, the rest is told as you tell the story in uh, thematic exhibits the first is you show the purpose why did Europeans, uh, namely the uh, British um, military system, why did they bring um, pigeons to New Zealand? Because they wanted to have them carrying the messages. And I show to you, I make it a little bit larger so you can see it a bit better, how a pigeon flight works. Here is a girl releasing a pigeon with a letter. Yeah, um, and then the pigeon flies and flies and flies, makes a turn, flies and returns to Colombier, which is a French word for pigeon loft, mm -hmm. to its home loft. Yeah, so this is a typical thematic way to do it, also with good material. Yeah, the first is a modern stamp, so it's shown as a die proof. Then you have the Basilea duff, quite famous one, and um, the earlier example of the first print in green, which was rejected. It was then issued with blue. Um, nice pre philatelic cover, but not, um, not very difficult. And then the most difficult to get out of that. This is not the Basilea duff. The most difficult are these local stems from Karlsruhe. Uh, in the 1880s and 1990s, um, German cities could run their private, pu private post offices for local mail. And this is the only, on reasonable stamps, this is the only stamp in which a pigeon with a letter in the beak flies to the right direction. On the other 120 stamps which exist, it always flies to the left. And to build this page to simulate this flight, I urgently needed these, and they are terribly difficult to get. Not expensive, completely inexpensive. Yeah. So, but from the semantic um, point of view, this is how to show um, the purpose. Then you show um, who came up with the idea to use uh, pigeons uh, in military. Uh, situations. That's from 1870, from the Siege of Paris, uh, the carrier's pigeon, which was, which were very famous, which were flown out with balloons um, out of Paris, and then returned with the messages uh, to Paris, with the individual messages attached. Yeah. And so, and then um, the Great Barrier uh, mail concludes the story on the first page of this philatelic study which is really thematic and what now follows is what you already know but only a choice of the most relevant items 
this is what uh, thematic philatelists uh, know conciseness of a philatelic study. Not to show the full story with all material, which is too time consuming, but only the most relevant um, um, <clears throat> items, which are the first uh, three stamp issues on flimsy, uh, which are the two triangle stamps in their first known usage, and which are uh, the Marutiri stamps. And then you need an end of the story, of course, a short end, which is the same as you have seen before. Uh, in 1905, it's all over. Yeah. And so this is a typical way uh, to concentrate even um, the story of a one frame exhibit to three, in this case, four pages for a philatelic study in a thematic philatelic. Okay. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Um, thank you very much um, for your attendance. And I hope you still have some remarks, questions, whatever, what makes uh, the afternoon a little bit more lively. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. This is great. This fantastic presentation and material. Excellent. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I guess we have some questions already. Uh, David. Damian, very nice exhibit. I want to congratulate you for your medals. Only one small question. The one frame is postal history, it's not thematic. Exactly. The one frame is actually airmail. Or it could be social yeah. postal history too. Okay. Yes, of course, because 50% uh, of the airmail exhibits can be shown in postal history. Uh, because they treat the transport of mail. And 50% of the airmail exhibits can be shown in traditional philately because they show um, the issue and usage of stamps. So there is no airmail treatment. There are some specialties in it, of course. Yeah. But essentially, um, you could choose. Um, so airmail philately does not really need a class, but for historical reasons, it has one. And of course, um, these are the first airmail stamps of the world. And so it clearly belongs when it comes to competitive exhibiting to airmail. Okay. Because always I thought you as a thematic philatelist. Oh, that, that is a huge misunderstanding. And my first exhibit I have exhibited in the youth class was actually traditional philately. And um, now uh, I've also um, postal history um, exhibits um, running and um, some, some further postal stationary exhibits and so on. Yeah, but I also do and I continue, I promise I will continue thematic philately. We need, we need someone to follow. <laughs> no, no, no worries. There are still some some thematic exhibits in the queue. Thank you, Damien. Nice to see you, Rafael. Okay. <clears throat> Good presentation. Thank you. Yeah. How was, I mean, the success rate of the pigeons arriving to the location? I mean, it was like one in 10 or? Mm, it was roughly 99%. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so sometimes um, they didn't want to fly out or so. This contributes to the 1%. Um, but over the years, um, only a dozen of the pigeons uh, were lost uh, in service. And the other question is, how do they carry? How do they carry the mail? I mean, I, Raudel sent me a link here, I have to look at it, but do the letters were just tied to the back or just they would get wet or what? Yeah, um, so um, this, um, this is now, I see. Because if it was raining, it would get wet, the mail. Yeah, that's a problem. and. Uh, New Zealand, they can have some heavy rainfall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first of all, of course, they looked at the weather of, um, before they started uh, to kill their own pigeons. Yeah. Uh, in really bad weather conditions, they wouldn't let them go. 
then they would have to delay it. And then the second is um, that they really could only affix it to the legs, as you can see here. Hope you can okay, see it. Like a band or something. Yeah, it's like a band, it's folded this way and then attached here around one of the legs. But would that create drag that would fly the pigeon all around? No, this, 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 no, no, if you, uh, if you attach it firmly, yeah, uh, you must train it. This is what Mr. Fricker writes to the governor of New Zealand. Um, train, train it first with a pen before uh, you attach it really to the leg of a pigeon so that it's firm uh, and it worked. So was the letter raw mm -hmm. or yes. just left open? Because otherwise it creates like a no, sail no, dragon. No, no. No, it, it was really it was really folded as you can see here. Oh, it was now I got it. Was it. Okay. Really it's like a band. folded that way. Okay, yes. now make this sense. is why you don't get them in what we call Swiss philatelic condition. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's quite evident uh, that they don't come in pristine uh, first day usage condition. Yeah, it run really through the mail, through the weather, through the air. Uh, around uh, the pigeons, maybe the pigeon had even uh, a hawk attacking it or something like that, uh, so uh, that it did some curves to escape yeah. it, and so yeah. And that was waterproof. It was waterproof. It was silk paper they used first oh, to okay. have it as light as possible, and the second is the silk paper is is quite almost waterproof. Um, it depends on a bit, of course, uh, how you wrote it. Um, but uh, if possible, they used the typewriting um, yeah. installation there. And so it was just invented by the time. And it was not absolutely waterproof, no. Mm -hmm. I would say more items have survived than are in philatelic collections nowadays, much more but they were in such terrible condition that you could hardly identify the message, uh, but absolutely not for philatelic purposes, for collector's purposes. Yeah. Thanks, awesome presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mauricio. Thank you, Damien, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, the first one, uh, regarding the stamps uh, themselves, uh, you mentioned that they were printed by a newspaper company. Were they printed in regular paper or newspaper paper? Due to the to, to thinking about the weight, because I, I, mm -hmm. in this case, every gram counts. Yeah. Um, so they they were printed um, in normal paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Um, so the weight of the stamp itself is not a lot. And usually they were even used um, if you had folded it, yeah, um, really to, to wrap it around to tighten it. Yeah? Like, uh, like seal. And, but then like the stamp was the... gone, of course. Yeah, it was no longer what comes out are parts of stamps in the end and they were no longer collectible. Yeah? But this is how it was used. Um, and one stamp, you, you, need, uh, you need a couple of stamps to reach a gram. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but it was good paper. It was quite mm -hmm. good paper quality they had. See. The, the, my second question is, um, is it known how many pigeons were used um, overall for this uh, service? Um, there is not an exact number. However, there are lists and each pigeon had a name. Mm -hmm. So it was quite clear which, was, which uh, were sent, how many there were. The total is a couple of dozen different pigeons for some 5,000 um, messages. Oh, thanks. And finally, was this service, while it lasted, was it all year round or uh, was it interrupted maybe during winter? It was all year round. Uh, Auckland has a has a quite has quite mild winters. They nice. hardly ever snow. Snow is on the South Island, um, but um, this like in the Mediterranean, so uh, it's 
winter days, normal winter days at Auckland have some 15 degrees and um, it was only interrupted with heavy storms. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, Damien, I have a, a couple of follow-ups. You kind of answered them already, but the flimsies were wrapped around the, the leg. The pigeons carry only one message or they were able to carry it one each? Yeah, uh, they, each they only were able to carry one message. Different okay. from this sketch of Paris, for, for, for instance, um, where they uh, photomechanically reduced the messages down to, to a microfilm. Yeah, uh, okay. there they could carry a lot of messages. Oh, one okay. pigeon had, had up to 100, 150 messages okay. in just one small capsule. But in this method, it, it was really an individual service. One to one. Okay. And, and a follow up with that. You mentioned 99% of the pigeons decided to fly. There was always some that did not. But did the service contemplate anything for lost mail and arrival? Was there any kind of compensation back to the to the sender if the message didn't make it there for whatever reason. Yeah, I have never seen um, so a form of contracts or something as we would have uh, nowadays. If you go uh, to a service on internet and you have um, all um, the rules um, which the company sets for the contracts. Yes. I've never seen that. They must have had, of course, uh, a contract um, but goods were not transported. It was just messages. Okay. And I, I could not find in, in all archive papers and so on anything about that. That's a very interesting question. I would like to have an answer. I ask it myself as well. Um, would they have compensated it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, what they could do in some when it was really urgent they offered, they sent two pigeons in parallel with the same message. Right, right. Then you have an almost 100% chance that at least one comes through. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's what I thought probably was, you know, best effort similar to the early times when mail, when people used to say duplicate or triplicate just in case because yeah. they couldn't have 100% assurance of it. So, yeah. Like with intercontinental, or intercontinental uh, ship mail, exactly. first half of the 19th century. Time. Yeah, exactly. So you're saying there was no disclaimer to the consumer? No, best no I don't know. <laughs> so there are there are no full documents. Um, uh, the a group of um, of enthusiasts uh, undertook um, the uh, challenge um, to compile everything and to write a book out of it. That's 60 years ago, and they are fair good. Only few things were discovered uh, in the later decades uh, to be added on that. Um, but um, all original cutouts of newspapers, illustrations, photographs, um, postcards, um, handwritten notes, everything what they could find is, is integrated uh, with uh, that book. So um, it's, quite all, uh, it's, it's quite all right. Uh, but unfortunately, there's nothing about the contracts to the user. The user. And surprise, you mentioned before that predators like hawks attacking the pigeons since they tend to key, they carry a letter or something that doesn't look normal, and they always the predators walk into that. They, oh, that pigeon is not flying quite right, and they will <laughs> attack it, that they didn't lose that many. Yeah. Um, so, fortunately enough, um, in New Zealand, um, there are not many predators. There's one falcon, which doesn't go over the water. Oh. So, that was a problem mm. for the first and last mile. Yeah, mm. and no more. And the other is, um, that falcon uh, was, of course, in his behavior, um, adapted um, to the flying indigenous New Zealand birds. and. Um, <laughs> so um, I think if this service would have run for a couple of hundreds of years, the uh, falcons would have adapted in the way you said, yes. Yeah, pigeons were not on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, well, of course they tried sometimes, if, if, but they couldn't get it. Yeah. So uh, there was an after space with those flimsy. They didn't like maybe, and that was <laughs> they were not <laughs> part of the menu. <laughs> Pure speculation, Henry. <laughs> I have another question. How much did it took a pigeon to fly that distance? Is it known? Um, yes, it's known. Um, so um, the sometimes only a little more than an hour. The average was oh. two hours. And the lazy ones, some oh, when, when they were uh, overdue for four hours or more, um, then they were probably lost. Yeah, that was on the presentation, right? On the, you have a comment on that, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I wow. think I saw it. Yeah. Excellent, excellent that you have seen it. Yes, uh, it's here in the newspaper already in 1897 um, when um, they said uh, have already flown the distance in one hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, that's great. So um, that's really fast. It's 100 kilometers. So that's an average of 80 uh, kilometers per hour. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, that depended on the wind. Um, maybe this was during the Matangi season. The Matangi um, is a um, wind system uh, coming from the northeast. It's a Passat wind um, to New Zealand. And uh, then um, they are, of course, much faster than when they have Western wind, for instance, what also occurs in, in New Zealand quite regularly, then they would be much slower. It's yeah. like today's aircrafts. If, if you can go um, uh, with the jet stream, then um, you can, from the United States to Europe, you can be, 90 minutes, almost 90 minutes faster than the other way around on the same day. That's great. Are there some comments on how to build a one frame exhibit? We, that, there, I'm sure there are tons of questions. We have a lot of discussion about those one frame when they when they are really a one frame and they were going to be you touching the key points in, in my opinion and actually damien i would like to use the the opportunity be we are trying to put together some sort of meeting discussion related to one frame and you have a fantastic perspective on very pointy items that really narrow down to to the ultimate success i would say because there are there are components in exhibiting that people just want to show stuff but there are components that really make that exhibit stand out in front of the others and be successful for the top prizes. So if that's okay with you, I would like to set up that schedule and maybe we set it up in another Sunday and try to, to, to work around that. We will have a panel of people who will, who will uh, have a different point of view. So will mm -hmm. coordinate but there will be tons tons of questions but there has been very many anyways uh, up to this point yeah but i have one a specific pointy question because i was at capex and i saw your exhibit i saw the other ones too mm -hmm. yes that's a good point yeah. that i appreciate that um, you are having this discussion uh because it's a quite new topic to most of us and um i think um, it uh, one frame exhibiting gives us fascinating opportunities yes to further develop philately and uh, okay, therefore okay. we should discuss it thoroughly and uh, yeah. i would be happy to be part of that discussion of course fantastic and one one remark that i want to make about the the treatment i would say you you have in your exhibit people when I don't know, it happens to me, maybe it happens to other individuals. When you walk in front of the frames, there is already a preset in your mind. This is a multi-frame, so you will give yourself extra time knowing that I will take a look here, I'll take a look at the second frame and go forward to it. But when it is a one frame, you have like 10 seconds opportunity to really get people attention. And in that one second, you have to highlight stuff. And I, I, and I guess you pointed out really well between the previous version of your exhibit with the newer version and the color navigation, I would say, 
because you see the color, which is a lot of innovation, and that caught your attention. So in the first 10 minutes, you are already engaged to find out what else is in it, not from reading anything. In 10 minutes, you haven't read anything other than the title, but the colors. At least you try to get something out of that. And I, I, I thought that was very clever. That's, yeah. that's the way to, to get people hooked to continue looking at this. Well, in, in this case, it, um, it was quite necessary to give people a, uh, a presentation at a glance of which of the two competitors we are talking about now. Yeah, that's important. What I think is the second aspect are the page titles. The yes. page title, especially if you have to deliver a story, then it needs some wording. It's uh, first you have, of course, to describe your items. Um, and then you have um, the background story. And um, so it is important to give a summary of the page. And if at a glance with a page title, you can read what it is all about, then you have a very good um, orientation already. Yes. Yeah? I think this is a second visual factor, um, which helps a lot. In, in any exhibits, in thematic philately, where we have uh, normally a little bit more text than other exhibition classes, um, it has already been um, a key factor now for 20 years or, or even longer uh, for the very successful exhibits uh, to use page titles. And I see it in more and more exhibits of other classes now as yep. well, that people understand when it becomes complicated, uh, give the people a summary. That, that's true. Many techniques for navigation control, but you're absolutely right. You need to have some guideline in order to, to navigate to that. Oh, there are a couple of hands raised out there. Jaime. Yes, Damien, thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. It, it, especially for those lucky of us that were able to see it in person in Toronto. My, my question is, is, is uh, uh, watching, watching your exhibit, uh, uh, I'm curious uh, as to uh, what, what points you lose uh, when, when it comes to the breakout, breakup of, of your, or, or the points you got, which were a lot. I'm, I'm curious as to what, uh, what were you lacking? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, in one sense, um, technically, uh, it was lacking nothing. Yeah. Um, in at Capex, so you know, you have seen it from so many FIP exhibitions how the jury struggled with the points of one frame exhibits. Yeah. And ups and downs of 10 or 15 points were not uncommon over the past five years. Oh, yeah. You're telling me that. So, <laughs> so uh, at CAPEX, um, the jury decided to score up to 94 points, first no. of all, and to say no more than 94. And this is the maximum we give. And then for those who ca are considered for the three Grand Prix, uh, the National, the Americas, and the Grand Prix Toronto, this is Grand Prix International, for those who are considered to be candidates, uh, we give 95 points and the jury presidium adds one. So um, that means the technical maximum for the jury teams was 94. And the second rule was out of the 94, um, importance must not be 10 to distinguish the one frame class from the multiple frame exhibits, we deduct for whatever they show, one for importance. These were the two rules uh, at CAPEX. I found it quite sensitive, and then they could add a 95th point as well uh, later on. Uh, but it meant that you did not have to be perfect for 94, because they, on, uh, but they would deduct points anyway. Yeah. And <clears throat> So uh, if you take off for all criteria, do you take off one or two for, for knowledge um, and uh, research, uh, which can easily be done, you can always take one off for treatment, then you are with 19 out of 20. Uh, you, you take 
in this case, of course, you take out one point uh, for condition or two. Um, and they did only one. Uh, so they appreciated that all items which are shown are shown in the best available condition. <laughs> but this condition is not very good. Yeah. Uh, so you hardly give a 10 for it. And uh, then I think. What about think importance? It, Pardon? What about the importance? Importance nine. Okay. They had to agree. Um, I think at a general exhibition where you have no limitations, you can give, can give 10. Um, at Lubapex, which I mentioned, where I showed it in 2017, the jury gave 10 for importance uh, because they said these are some of the most important items of a full exhibition class, not of one area. But it is the first airmail stamp of the world in a full sheet. It is one of the three known usages of the first airmail stamp of the world. It is the first first day cover of airmail philately in the world. It is the only telegram which was sent by pigeons. It is the most important pigeon mail item in the world. And so um, this goes beyond um, the topic of the exhibit in its importance. And that is why. Um, then five years ago at uh, Lubapex, um, they said, okay, we give 10 for importance. I see. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. Here we need, as, as exhibitors, we need to be flexible. Because if we have to judge one frame exhibits, we see how difficult it is to always to compare it within the class and with a multiple frame class. Yeah. This is a real challenge for all jurors. Mm -hmm. And as exhibitors, we must accept that even skilled jurors come out with, diff with different solutions um, how um, to tackle both problems in parallel. Yes. Yeah? This is something as exhibitors, I think we need to ex uh, accept. We cannot expect uh, from, us, from us as jurors um, that uh, we have the perfect solution for that. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Luis Fernando. Gracias, Henry. I think I can make it in English, pero la mayoría de ustedes no saben que Damián habla un perfecto español. No habla un perfecto, entiende uh, lo que tú dices, um, <laughs> pero solamente cuando son las cosas no complicadas, cuando son las cosas más complicadas, claro que prefiero uh, inglés. Gracias. Esta no es complicada. Bueno. En Capex, de todos los que estamos aquí, yo soy el único que estuvo en el jurado de Capex. Uh -huh. En Capex, el jurado no decidió 94 puntos. ¿Qué decidió entonces? No, no, no fue el jurado. No puedo decir más. Uh -huh. Ah, no sabía eso, no, no, no es tu... The jury never decided about 94 or 93 or 95 as a limit. Yeah, so it was uh, the jury presidium, which... Uh... I don't know who. Okay. I don't know how. Yeah. yeah, so I was just, because I was not part of the jury, so I, I just heard that uh, before the jury work started, they had arranged a small thing like a seminar where they distributed this information uh, with this limit. Maybe I missed yeah, We have discussed that. We have discussed that here and we should discuss again and we are going to discuss in a real great number of forms because this is a real great point. Mm -hmm. what, what we're living with this is, um, is one frame, second class philately. And it is not. Lo voy a decir en español. La sí. verdadera discusión de fondo es si la, el coleccionismo de un marco es filatelia de segunda clase. Y no es filatelia de segunda clase. La colección de Damián no estaba en mi grupo de jurado. Pero si hubiera estado en mi grupo de jurado, Yo tengo problemas serios con los 94 puntos. Esta, esta colección. Porque es más que 94. Yeah, so finally they gave one more, so it came out with sí, 95. Sí, which sí, was exactly the same. Yeah, 
which was exactly the same score um, the jury at Lubapex five years ago had. Yeah. Yeah. It was 50% um, jury members uh, from Latin America, by the way. Yes. And um, they also came out with 95. And uh, what you are saying, Luis Fernando, is exactly the right thing. Uh, one frame philately must not be or must not become secondhand philately. It's on its own merits. Yeah? yeah. So, yes, sir. And um, this is, uh, and, uh, but, but at exhibitions, of course, we need, sometimes we need to compare it. Um, now I had with, apart from CAPEX on national level, LUPRAPEX and uh, we call it Alpa Adria, which is a um, <clears throat> national exhibition for joint for all uh, countries belonging to the Alps. And there, um, a different exhibit, one frame exhibit of mine in thematic philately, won the Grand Prix against all multi frame exhibits. And so that was also a tough discussion in the jury is that possible or not? Yeah. And how can we compare the scores? And um, so, in that case, however, it seemed to the jury it was cli quite clear. Yeah, um, but um, you are really mentioning, Luis Fernando, uh, what is the key point? How can we make um, one frame exhibit exhibiting mm -hmm. uh, high class on its own mer uh, merits without spoiling the multiple frame exhibits, mm -hmm. which what we must ex ex uh, accept, which show five or eight times more material? Yeah. Uh, this is also a matter of fact, and for me, there is no perfect solution. And I think this is very, very interesting to uh, to find uh, at least um, a common sense. If there is no perfect solution, that we have a common sense amongst us jurors. That's great, common sense. Yeah, we, it, it, we it wasn't that the case. You should know. Yeah. <laughs> no, look. Uh, uh, there were great exhibits in in Cape Yeah, two two of them are represented here now: Henry Marcus and and Jaime Benavides. The two of, of their their own exhibits are all from the Latin American collections. Probably some of the best you can find, unique, and they weren't treated as unique. They were mm -hmm. they were treated as a second class philately. Even Henrys who 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 had a chance to to compete for a high price. Yeah. Well, so, well, you know, you know, as a juror, we shouldn't say these things. Mm -hmm. hay, hay una hay una sanción si decimos todo. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, I, I fully I fully see your point. Uh, of course, as an exhibitor, I'm biased. As an exhibitor, I also always want that the jury uses a full score up to 100 points. Yeah, of course. This is my bias. As, as, as a juror, I would like that as well. Yes, and um, and in fact, we use the score uh, scores up to 97. That's in in FIP 98. From time to time, happens, but. Uh, 97 is uh, what is usually the maximum at an exhibition. And I fully agree with you, Luis Fernando, that if we speak of the best one frame exhibits being in existence, that we use should use the same range of points. Yeah, I fully agree with that view. And as a, as a juror, I would not be reluctant to that. Yes. If I see a really outstanding at, at CAPEX, we had five, six really outstanding exhibits. There were. Yeah, uh, and fine. And, and I was so happy that I was not on the jury because then I had really time to select my favorites and to read them from the first to the last and from the last to the first page, which I could not do even being in the jury. Yeah, and uh, there was uh, a number of quite good ones. And so, um, of course, in a different setting of a different organizers and jury presidium, the jury might have 
um, decided to give two or three 97 points. Why not? Sure. Yeah. Hay algo que quiero decir en español, eh, Henry. Eh, Adelante. Le, estoy quitando, le estoy quitando mucho tiempo al que sigue, que es Reinaldo, y seguramente va a tener cosas muy grandes que decir. Pero, pero hay algo que yo quiero decir para beneficio de mis coleccionistas y beneficio de lo que yo he dicho aquí en este foro sobre el coleccionismo de un marco y el bien o mal de Capex. Eh, Damián hoy nos habló de tres reglas de oro para hacer colecciones de un marco de gran premio. Esas tres reglas de oro son muy claras. Yo diría que falta una. La, la regla que falta en lo que Damián nos puso es la regla de que no deben pasar el tamaño de un marco ni siquiera en expectativa. O sea, no es solo que esté todo lo importante, sino que eso sea lo importante. Um, es biunívoca la relación entre material y tamaño, entre material y un marco. Yo llevé 18 colecciones de Costa Rica. 16 cumplían las tres reglas de Damián, más la que yo acabo de poner. Por eso es que yo reacciono tan fuerte contra Capex cada vez que se habla de cosas de Capex. Uh -huh. Damián y su colección, y la de Henry, y la de Jaime, y la de muchísimos más, eran maravillosas. ¿Cómo que no merecía 98, o 97, o 99, o 100? ¿Quién dijo que no? Ahí están las cuatro reglas. Lo que Damián nos ha mostrado hoy, lo que vimos en Capex, no es de 94. Si a Damián le dan 94, a todos los que siguen le están quitando también cuatro puntos. A todos los que siguen le están quitando cuatro puntos. Las colecciones son lo que son. No hay filatelia de segunda clase. No hay filatelia de segunda clase. Y la filatelia de Latinoamérica no es filatelia de segunda clase. La filatelia de una isla de Nueva Zelanda no es filatelia de segunda clase. Gracias, Damián. Una maravillosa exposición, una maravillosa colección de 98 puntos para este jurado de Cape Porque solo Dios saca 100 de 99. Me, si, si Reinando me permite solo un comentario pequeñito, lo hago en español y después lo resumo. Eh, yo creo que Capex tuvo una, una oportunidad que se perdió y porque en realidad lo que se debe pensar ya es no en usar el ceiling del multiframe como el tope de todo, sino hay que pensar ya en categorías porque el mismo problema que existe con el one frame existe con filatelia moderna y en filatelia moderna hay rarezas que superan al siglo XIX. Pero como es moderno, como es el siglo XX, se ignora y acá sí hablamos de todo el mundo. Entonces yo creo que es hora y que menos mal que Reinaldo está ahí, que lo escuche y lo lleve a la, al nuevo borde de la FIP. Es momento de crear categorías y cada categoría juega en, en su lado. La, la, las exposiciones han evolucionado, que todo era tradicional a todas las clases que tenemos. Yo creo que ya estamos en ese punto que hay que pasar categorías. Es, es opinión personal y a, ahí lo dejo. Sé que todos lo entendieron, así que lo dejo ahí nomás. Reinaldo. Ah, no, no, no te escuchamos. Ahora, ahora está mejor. Ahora sí. ¿Me escucha? Ahora sí, 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 ahora sí. ¿Me escucha? Sí, sí, sí te escuchamos. Yo no escucho a ustedes. Un rato. Ok.
problemas técnicos paulistas. Uh, ¿Ahora me oyen? Sí, te escuchamos. Sí. Ok, thank you. First of all, I'd like to express that I agree 100% with you, Henry, and with you, Luis Fernando. Uh, one frame is not the second class of philately. Uh, return my original thoughts, uh, Damien. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. Congratulations for your good exhibition. And uh, it's very interesting because normally when you heard Damien Lage exhibit the first point that you think is a thematic exhibit, and you show us uh, postal history exhibition, it, it was wonderful. My original question was to Damien, but after the speech of Luis Fernando, uh, I need to ask you, Luis Fernando, sorry, there is a specific reason to put as the top limit 94%, because it's, it's unbelievable that one jury and the level that I expect to have in CAPEX started with this type of uh, decision, put a limit of 94%. There is a specific reason for it or not? It was it's a just surprise. Thing. Because I never heard it in my life. You start to say you are not competing for 100% of the points. You are competing only for 94%. You, you start with a, a penalization for everyone. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, no one of us could really answer your question now mm -hmm. because uh, no one of us now here in this attendance set this, uh, this rule. Yeah. Um, However, from what I understood is that the organizers felt that they have to cope with several problems. One is that um, most of the jurors at CAPEX were national jurors, um, mainly from Canada and the United States. And they are used to give even more than 100. I think they have a maximum of 102 points for one frame exhibits. Mm. And they feared that with an exhibition with FIP recognition, they would not be in line with uh, FIP scores um, when they apply their national customs of judging one frame exhibits. I think that was one main reason. And the second, what I understood, um, I, I had the same question as you, uh, Renaldo. Yeah? Ask the people, why did you do that? And they said, then the second is that we wanted to have all jury teams and all, um, all classes uh, on the same level when it comes to the top exhibits. Not just one class say, no, we don't give more than 88 points and other classes say, oh, we give 100. And uh, so this is my understanding. I was not in the room when there was a seminar uh, on that when these rules were announced. Um, but this is what I understand was the rational behind was. It is one of the many solutions and um, to the top exhibitors, it was not the best solution. And what Luis Fernando said um, really applies that some other exhibits, uh, which might have got a 93 points, got only a 90, for example, uh, because everything was a little bit more modest than it could have been. Yeah? But this is a matter of fact, and we should see in the end, I think um, if you look at the candidates for the three Grand Prix, the selection, you can always discuss one exhibit or the other, but in total, the selection of the candidates of Grand Prix really reflected the quality of the exhibits. So what they finally did, what the jury did, was absolutely all right. Um, we are just now claiming that it would be possible to have two or three points more in the maximum. Reinaldo, ¿puedo contestar dos cosas chiquititas? Por favor. First, there were, that wasn't a seminar. A seminar is a very different thing. I'm not going to discuss today what is a seminar. But you, Damien, and myself, we are university professors, and we do know what a seminar is. That is, that wasn't a seminar. That's it. I'm, I'm going to discuss that. And the second point 
regarding the, the not the higher level of points exhibits, but the lower ones. It was a very, I don't know how to say that in the, in the best way. We expected more from, from CAPEX, but not for the higher level exhibits. The lower level exhibits, exactly those were the ones to be promoted and, in, and encouraged, not the higher ones. Damian Lage doesn't need another Grand Prix. It's nice, but, he, he but he's got enough. There are a lot of people that need moving from 82 to 85. There are a lot of people needing to move from large male level into goal level to be encouraged to continue. And their exhibits do um, they, they are already at that level. Let, let me, Jaime, me permitís decirlo. No te oigo, Jaime. No, creo que está en la sorry, llamada telefónica. So, no, sorry, no, uh, sorry uh, just, just to do additional comment, Luis Fernando. Okay. Uh, you just comment that this decision to have as a uh, top limit in night four was discussion in a seminar? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, <laughs> it wasn't discussed. Ju jurors were not asked about. We jurors had no seminar. Uh, I'm not talking about the jury discussions, you see? But yeah, this okay. is not a jury discussion. May, uh, may I propose? Only... Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt you guys. I, I know we are very passionate about that topic, uh, myself included and others who aren't here. But I am definitely going to put the effort to set up that time. And, and Damien, I will take your, your, your point of view and, and we'll try to set it up for a specific talking on, 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 the, on, the, num, on the one frame because uh, there are tons of positions on that and, uh, and every single point of view is valid. But um, you know, uh, to be respectful of the time, I know for you it's almost 10 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Or, or getting close to that. I, that I is fine, sure that but, we are respectful um, of that. Tomorrow we have um, uh, Ascension de Maria. I, I don't know what is it's Ascension uh, yeah. day. <laughs> okay. And uh, in Lucerne, because we are one of the few Catholic cities in uh, Switzerland, yeah. uh, in Lucerne we don't work at that day. So I'm quite. Oh, excited. I didn't know that. Gee. Luis Fernando, but Reynaldo, it's, it's please come back. You are Sunday afternoon. You have many family affairs usually and, and so on. Uh, so I think you are under tougher time pressure than I would be sure. on Sunday. No, yo creo que Henry tiene razón. Hay que hacer una discusión aparte para esto. Uh -huh. Incluso porque de verdad, yo por lo menos me pongo muy emocional o parece que me pongo muy emocional. Eh, eh, pero es estratégico. Es una... Eh, sí. Eh, y y es, es importante porque el, para mí el punto de una colección de un marco es motivar. Y motivar, si, motivar, claro. Eh, es, y, sí, sí, y per, es, pero sí, amigos, sí. perdóname, el motivar, eh, imaginando la colección de un marco, es una, una exposición motivacional. Esto se pasa quizá en las competiciones que tenemos en nuestros países. Cuando se llega a un nivel, un nivel FIPE, no es motivacional. Ya, ya es una colección que está en competencia. Entonces, FIPE no es para motivar la, la colección de un marco. FIPE es para efectivamente se te, estar exponiendo colecciones que se tiene que exponer y un marco. Eh, este, yo sí. creo que, que esto, esto se tiene que, que estar distintos. Acá en Brasil, un marco la tenemos como promocionar, como motivación o que quieras. Pero en el momento que la colección tiene que estar presentada en una exposición de FIPE, no es mo más motivacional, es efectivamente una competencia. Eh, de acuerdo totalmente. Uh, en, en el contexto de tiempo, digamos, que yo uso el, el, te el tema motivar es... Estás absolutamente de acuerdo. Localmente yo expongo de esta manera, quizás continental, si voy a, ot a las grandes ligas, todavía en mi percepción hay la necesidad de motivar a continuar en las grandes ligas, porque si me voy a estrellar de cara en las grandes ligas, simple y llanamente la reacción natural es no regresar más. Entonces sí, yo creo que es. el factor de motivación siempre va a estar independientemente de lo que sea, incluyendo en los grandes premios. 
incluyendo sí, puri, los grandes puri, premios. Por eso es que eh, puri, discutimos tanto acerca de la importancia y todo ese tipo de cosas. Eh, no, concordo plenamente, Henry. Por eso que para mí es un, un caso raro que un jury asuma que una colección só puede llegar hasta 94 puntos. Todas las colecciones para mí están compitiendo por 100 puntos. Claro, Esto para mí es algo raro. Claro. Totalmente de acuerdo. Bueno, esa va a ser una, una excelente charla y tenemos muchos otros puntos de vista. Damien, el, your point of view is going to be fantastic. There. We, as you can see here, we, we show our passion to the topic and that's for very good reasons. We, we want this. Yes. We want Philately to be successful and we want Philatelist to come after us. We don't want to be the last one. <laughs> Basically, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any additional question? Otra pregunta para, o comentario para Damián. Y eso que no hemos tocado las colecciones de tres marcos que no existen todavía, pero eso es para otro día. ¿Alguna, al, yo quisiera hacer una pregunta, Henry. Dale, Omar. ¿Alguna colección de un marco temática ha obtenido 90 puntos o más? Sí, um, la, de, la de Damián en, en Capex. No, pero es tu historia postal. No, pero sí, sí, sí. No, la otra, la otra. La de Sergio, la de Sergio Recuen, con su momento tuvo 90 puntos en una mundial, aunque luego eh, cayó 88 y ha tenido varias participaciones con 88, pero en su momento hubo una Expo Mundial que tuvo 90 puntos. Yeah. So, at Capex, Luis Fernando knows that uh, I also had um, uh, a thematic exhibit. Uh, only not to disappoint uh, David because he thinks I'm no longer a somatic philatelist. Uh, <laughs> um, that exhibit also got 95 points. Nice. Yeah, also, so it's really? possible with, uh, but, but with thematic philately, it's, it's even more complicated, I think, to find the right theme and uh, to build it up. And uh, I also heard some critical comments also from Luis Fernando. Um, about the relationship with other exhibits I have and so on. Uh, so um, in, <clears throat> uh, but um, the full range and, and frankly, to be said, the team came to me later on and said, oh, Damian, we are so sorry. We could only give 95 points. We wanted to give 96, but then the jury presidium reduced it to 94. And later on, they increased it because it was a potential candidate for the Grand Prix. They increased it again, to, but only to 95. So uh, you see, yeah, you, you see, this is, this is in the mind of the people that they judge the full score. Yeah, it was instructed by the jury presidium to proceed this way at CAPEX. Mm -hmm. We accepted that it was at this exhibition. Um, and we foresee that other um, FIP exhibitions, which hopefully will come uh, with FIP recognition of as wide frame exhibits, exhibitions, that they will proceed in a different way. Yeah. And, but it's, it's possible to make it in all classes, to make really top exhibits um, in, in one frame. Yep. That's pretty good. Uh, well, yeah. gracias, gracias. With, with that remark and all the excellent discussions coming and of course the outstanding presentation from Damien. Damien, once again, thank you very much for showing us your expertise and, and your exhibit. We, we appreciate it very much. And you are on point for, you're gonna be part of the panel when we discuss the one frame. In addition to, Damien has another presentation. Hay otra presentación de Damien que es más específica también para eso y es en diciembre, diciembre 11, si no me equivoco. Por acá la tenía. Um, uh -huh. Y ahí vamos a estar hablando una cosa más específica. Gracias nuevamente, Damien. Yeah, thank you very much. Gracias thank a you. todos. Um, Gracias, Damien. Gracias, Damien. Gracias. 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 Y el día de mañana.